word shark usually brings to mind something like this. It's a blue shark. It has the classic shark body shape and the classic association with underwater clouds of red. This crimson tide isn't blood though. It's a mass of tiny shrimp-like animals called krill. Their super streamlined bodies, sculpted by millions of years of evolution, are so finely tuned that a blue shark can never stop swimming. Its gills need constant motion to absorb oxygen. Stillness would mean suffocation. Blue sharks, like most sharks, live in tropical waters. But most is about all you can ever say when generalizing about sharks. They are a theme with hundreds of variations. Sharks live in every ocean in the world, even as far from the tropics as this. Ice, ice is the word up here, and it doesn't matter whether you're a shark or whether you're a person fishing for a shark, you have to deal with the ice, so we've got to dig a hole through the ice, through eight feet of sea ice. It takes a while, it could take a half a day to dig a hole big enough for a big shark. George Benz is on the Arctic ice cap, trying to get through to a Greenland shark. Among the few known facts about this animal are that it lives farther north than any other shark, that it's huge, up to seven meters, and that it's thought to live right at the sea bottom. I'll check that out. Look at that. There's the hole. Wow, it's bright. A remote-controlled infrared television camera can take human vision into an otherwise impossible place. What's the bottom? 4, 490, 494? 490, 492, somewhere in there. We're almost at the bottom. Should be coming up very shortly. There it is. Ah, all rock. <laughs> Urchins. In total darkness, under extreme pressures, only a few deep sea creatures like brittle stars can survive here. An improbable place then to find a gigantic predator. Two of the Greenland shark's particular mysteries are exactly what it eats and how it eats it. The how is a revelation. The shark hangs upside down and rotates, carving out plugs of flesh with its shearing lower teeth. Greenland sharks do leave these depths. They're known, for instance, to follow fishing boats. And they're even known to eat land mammals. A whole reindeer, minus the antlers, was once found in one stomach. But the question remains how the shark caught it. Greenland sharks are scavengers of the deep, but can they also attack and kill at the surface? This is what George Benz wants to find out. The idea is to tag and then track the shark, discovering how much time it spends near the surface. At minus 20 degrees, they have to work fast, or the shark's gills will freeze. Roll right over, Watch shark. Roll right in. Yep. All right. Ready? All right, let's go. In. As far as anyone can tell, the shark is completely unaffected by the experience it's just had. shark is unusually sluggish, and just for good measure, its flesh is toxic, so it's rarely hunted. Stranger still, this creature is virtually blind. Attached to its eyes are parasites with two worm-like egg cases. No one knows what they're doing there. Now tagged with an acoustic transmitter, this female can provide the first clues about what Greenland sharks do under the ice. Will she plunge straight back into deep water or remain close to the surface? 
The tag sends sound pulses to receivers embedded in the ice. Those last three were strong. Yeah. She's plateaued at 144 meters. But that's only the last few minutes, but she's not going any deeper, and we know it's deeper out there. The female does not head straight down to the sea floor, but continues to swim around under the ice, literally beneath the scientist's feet. This proves that Greenland sharks do not spend all their time at depth and may well be active predators of the ice. If living sharks are hard to fathom, imagine trying to unlock the secrets of the dead. Australia is the final resting place of some of the world's oldest sharks. Gavin Young has found fossils here that date back to the Devonian era, almost half a billion years ago. At that time, a massive inland sea covered half of Australia. We can see here the sedimentary layers that were deposited over many thousands of years at the bottom of this deep lake. And each time I prise open one of these layers, I'm exposing the surface to the light for the first time in 400 million years. This is a very important specimen. Here we have the portion of the brain case, and we can see the little grooves that would have contained blood vessels or sensory canals crossing the head of the shark. And just beside it, patches of skin impressions. To look at them, you would never guess how rare these fossils are. Sharks leave precious few fossils behind when they die. That's because their boneless skeletons tend to decompose before the gradual process of fossilization can even begin. The most that's left behind, usually, are some fragments of scales and teeth, a pretty meagre basis for reconstructing a whole shark, or for that matter, a whole history of sharks. But then there are a few places like this, where, by a fluke of chemistry and climate, ancient sharks have been frozen in time. The breakthrough came when I discovered these impressions of tiny teeth, just the same as the ones I'd found in similar rocks in Antarctica. The teeth match those of Antarctolamna, the ancient southern shark. But why were its fossils scattered across the globe on continents thousands of kilometres apart? The world was a very different place in the Devonian, if you did an ultra-quick rewind of the map of the Earth, you'd see the continents as they were then. Australia and Antarctica were joined as part of Gondwana land, a giant southern landmass. At the time of the first sharks, the land was still virtually lifeless. The sea was where the action was. Other ancient sharks have been chipped out of rocks across the world. Their names are evocative, Diadomodus, Cladosalaki, and Machmodotus, each a pioneer of its time. It is impossible to know for sure what these extinct creatures were like. The best we can do is guess. The first sharks were the most advanced creatures alive. There were some primitive fishes, but they were not fast enough to escape the swift new predators. Sharks were not without their enemies, such as the monstrous armor-plated fish, Dunkleosteus, that preyed on them, or tried to. But sharks soon outswam them too. Shortly after their first appearance, the sharks took over the seas and are still firmly in residence today. Australia is not only a shark graveyard, it remains the world's stronghold for living sharks particularly along the Great Barrier Reef. Hammerheads have a prehistoric appearance, but are a relatively new model, only about 20 million years old. With eyes at each end of their hammer, they see the world in double vision. Like all sharks, their design is ever-changing. New evidence suggests the hammer is shrinking as evolution perfects their strange design still further. White-tipped reef sharks 
have existed twice as long as hammerheads and conform to the more traditional shape. They use their eyesight to identify each other, since each of the white tips that give the sharks their name is slightly different. And the reason they might need to recognize each other is that they sometimes hunt in packs. Sharks of this type have a reputation as mindless killing machines, but in fact, theirs are the largest brains of all the fish. They have outwitted their bony cousins for millions of years. The white tips have evolved blunt heads and eel-like bodies that enable them to squeeze between the coral. find a sleeping fish, they can descale it in an instant. Though capable of killing alone, teamwork makes white tips even more efficient hunters. When fish try to hide in the rocky crevices, the sharks can surround the coral, blocking off all possible exits. As a last resort, the fishes lodge themselves into the crevices with their spines, but the shark's needle-like teeth can tear them out. On the falling tide, the white tips return to their resting caves in deeper water. Sharks carve up the reef into three-dimensional hunting territories. The wobbegong is a bizarre-looking ambush predator of the shallows. Strange tassels on its head and its beautifully patterned skin blend in with the coral. Unlike the wobbegong, the grey reef shark does not disguise its approach. It rises from the depths to hunt cornering unwary fishes on the reef edge. And this is what people call a zebra shark. That's because it's named for its juvenile pattern before its stripes change to spots. Unlike a lot of sharks, it has the ability to pump water over its gills which means it doesn't have to spend its life swimming. Lying still, it can tune its ultra-sensitive snout to the slightest movement of its prey, soft-bodied worms and crabs that it sucks out of the sand. Since sharks and bony fish went their separate ways, they've been in constant competition with each other, unknowing rivals in the great evolutionary race. Sharks may be the top predators, but the bony fish have won the numbers game. There are more than 12,000 living species to just over 1,000 sharks and rays. There was once a time when 70% of fish in the sea were sharks. They were as colorful and abundant as the reef fishes are today. This was their heyday, the age of sharks. Today, the only reminders of that glorious time are the teeth they have left behind. Shark fossils are collected by paleontologists all over the world. In rocks 300 million years old, they have found teeth of every imaginable shape, but they all have one thing in common. They don't match the teeth of any present day shark. Some designs are truly mystifying. This whirl of teeth belong to a killer called Helicoprion. Quite how it worked is anyone's guess. 
Using fossil evidence and a little educated imagination, scientists have painted a picture of what it might have been like to swim in the shark-infested seas of the Carboniferous. The most abundant sharks were the unicorns, only about half a meter long. The male had a single antler that was probably used like a peacock's tail to impress females. But attracting too much attention was dangerous with the likes of the big, bizarre Stethacanthus around. It terrorized the smaller sharks, but they had special means of escape. Inneopteryx could fly. Helicoprion, the whirltooth shark, might have looked something like this and used its sawmill teeth to prey on the hard-shelled creatures of the day, ammonites. During the age of sharks, all this was normal. This was how the world was. And then the world ended. It's known as the Permian mass extinction, the greatest disaster of all time. No one knows what caused it. The continents were colliding. There were massive eruptions, fluctuating temperatures, and the seas were shrinking. The effects of this extinction were devastating. Around 90% of marine creatures were wiped out. Such mass extinctions are like curtains at the end of an act. In time, they lift and something else is happening. The age of bony fishes was here. In the race to repopulate the oceans, they had a fundamental advantage over the sharks. They could reproduce quickly. Sharks have always had complicated sex lives. After the Permian mass extinction, this almost caused their downfall. It took the sharks more than 100 million years to recover from the Permian mass extinction. Because of their complicated sex lives, they struggled to keep up with the bony fish. And sex itself is still a bit of a struggle. In the shallow lagoons of the Bahamas, nurse sharks gather for an age-old ritual. Most fishes simply release their fertilized eggs into the sea, but the sharks have to go through this. They have to because their eggs are fertilized internally. Sex for sharks means getting dangerously close to one another. Male sharks are well endowed with two mating claspers, the only visible difference between the sexes. He clamps his jaws around her fins to twist her into position, but she is reluctant to mate with just any old male. But his persistence eventually wins her over. It is a sign of the quality of the genes he will pass on to their offspring. No one knows where nurse sharks drop their young, but these shallow lagoons are the breeding grounds for another shark, the lemon. More than half of all sharks give birth to live young. This female has been pregnant for almost a year. Inside her womb-like belly, up to 14 babies are waiting to break free. It is perhaps at this moment, more than any other, that it is possible for us to identify with sharks. This female is not just a fish, but an animal giving birth in the same way as we do. 
Surprisingly, sharks started doing this millions of years before the mammals had even appeared on Earth. One big difference, though, a shark mother has nothing further to do with her babies. As soon as they've broken free from the umbilicus, they are out in the world and on their own. Specifically, they're in among the mangrove roots, where baby-eating adult sharks can't reach them. The mangroves are a safe nursery for young lemons and other small fish. But the young sharks are nervous in a way they'll never be as adults. Otherwise, they're the terror of the mangroves. And as adults, they'll be terrors of the deep and the shallows. In the seagrass beds, a lobster tries to defend itself from an adult nurse shark. This scene has been reenacted longer than almost any other because the nurse is a living dinosaur, one of the most ancient of all sharks, whose ancestors date back around 200 million years. The dawning of a new chapter in shark history began in the changing seas of the Jurassic. It was one of those periods when the Earth seemed to be turning itself inside out. Intense volcanic activity shook the foundations of Pangaea, a massive continent that covered half the world at that time. But the forces weren't just destructive, they also created new opportunities. As this vast continent split, the splits themselves filled with water and became seas, shallow seas, rich in sunlight and life. Over millions of years, the continents kept splitting and drifting farther away from each other. The seas became oceans that eventually resembled the oceans of today. As the world modernized, so too did the sharks. During the Jurassic, the ancestors of living species were born. This was the dawning of a brave new world. On the land and in the air, a previously minor form of life was taking over. It was the age of the dinosaurs. And in the seas were a changing generation of sharks, some of them very like those that are still here today. The Port Jackson shark with its pig-like snout is a truly ancient creature. It's about as close to a Jurassic shark as you can get. Its ancestors first appeared in those prehistoric seas. The Port Jackson is a creature of age-old habits. Every August, under the first full moon, these sharks start to converge on their breeding grounds off the Australian coast, not far from Sydney. To get here, they have swum thousands of kilometers, and the females pile up together to recover. But the smaller males don't want to rest, they want to mate. Port Jackson's reproduce the old way, the way it is believed prehistoric sharks did. Instead of giving birth to live young, they lay eggs. 
Every fortnight, each adult female produces two spiral-shaped eggs. Sometimes a male will pick an egg up, probably to help lodge it in the rocks. Each one is designed like a corkscrew, so it can be firmly wedged. If not, it is at the mercy of the elements. Hundreds wash up on the beaches, the casualties of reproductive roulette. They will play no part in the future of sharks. But thanks to good fortune or design, those eggs that held fast start to hatch nine months later. Getting out of the egg case is a battle for the tiny shark, only 20 centimeters long. Like any shark pup, its first instinct is to head for a place that's safe for youngsters. And away from adults. For the young Port Jackson, these seagrass beds are nursery grounds where it can suck worms and crustaceans out of the sand. All safe and plentiful enough, but this nursery ground is in someone else's territory. Another bottom feeder, an eastern fiddler ray, declares that the pickings on this piece of ground are its own. This will be the pup's home for the next few years. One of the few sharks whose lifespan is known, these Port Jacksons will return here for the next 25 years. As for the ray, it and the shark have a lot in common. In fact, it is a kind of shark, and it's a form that also originated in the Jurassic. Over that vast period, one group of sharks began to concentrate on bottom feeding. In time, their mouths moved underneath their heads and their bodies flattened out. Their pectoral fins grew forward, taking in their heads, and turned into something like wings. This transformation has made them some of the ocean's most graceful swimmers. Now there are more than 500 species of rays, and the manta ray, with its six-metre span, is the most magnificent of all. motion acrobats, they loop feed through the water as though it were air. The manta is probably about as far as you can get from the cliched image of the predatory shark, but it's an older model than the classic stars of the big screen. Those flesh-ripping jaws types though familiar to us, have existed for only a relatively short time. But it didn't take the newcomers long to dominate the oceans. Every year, down in the blue water lagoons of the Great Barrier Reef, green turtles gather in their hundreds to find a partner and mate. It was in the Jurassic that these turtles' forebears took to the sea. But in one sense, they never left the land. They still have to go ashore to lay their eggs. Theirs has been a story of scheduled mayhem. This tiger, a shark that eats anything from floating rubbish to people, has brain enough to know when the turtles will arrive. And it's waiting. As tired as she is after the rigors of mating, this turtle still has to go to the top of the beach. But in time, she'll be back, which is something else the tiger shark knows.
tigers are hunters of dark waters. Their eyesight is 10 times more sensitive than our own in dim light. It waits. She's an old turtle and she does what she's been doing every year for maybe 60 years. After a few hours on dry land, it's time for another year in the water. This is her low point, the most exhausted she gets. Every year, weakened females die on the beaches. Perhaps they are the lucky ones. A tiger shark can literally smell distress. It picks up the odor trail half a kilometer away and knows when an animal's ripe for the kill. At closer range, the turtle's movement creates waves of pressure that touch the tiger. It can feel at a distance. And then the electrical sense kicks in. Even the beating of the turtle's heart is enough to give her away. no chance of surviving this. The tiger's jaws are filled with row upon row of constantly renewed teeth, a conveyor belt of serrated blades. It can rip the turtle out of her shell. But not all modern sharks are so bloodthirsty. About 60 million years ago, some adopted an entirely different approach. Every year, right on time, the remote waters off the Australian west coast are visited by giants. Uh, you appear to be uh, a wild shark uh, about uh, two to 300 metres, Trevor. Great, Joe. Of the shark in relation to the boat and the direction in which it's swimming. Okay, whale shark, 10 o'clock, 150 metres. This is the whale shark. Length, 18 metres. Weight, 20 tonnes. It's the largest fish in the sea. and it feeds on only the smallest things in the sea, plankton, the countless tiny plants and animals, fish eggs, and general living flotsam that drifts on the currents. Throughout the year, a whale shark glides with the currents and skims off the cream of the plankton. Assorted bony fishes always swim with it, using its bulk for protection and its wake as an effort-saving slipstream. The shark's mouth is wide open, a human could stand in it. Along with many others, this shark is feeding on a plankton bloom that appears every year off Ningaloo Reef. And when the bloom goes, so do the sharks. And no one knows where. 
They're the biggest fish in the world, and yet they can just vanish. It's a measure of how enormous the sea is and how little people understand it. The technology of the space age is about to change all that. Armed with a dart gun, these scientists have come to satellite tag a whale shark for the first time. Until now, radio tags have only been able to track the sharks over small distances, and they go much, much further than that. The transmitter sends signals thousands of kilometers into space. From now on, every time she surfaces, she will be pinpointed, wherever she has got to. Six weeks later, and some questions are already being answered. The shark is now off the north coast of Australia, a thousand kilometers from where she was tagged. The bigger the fish, the smaller the sea and whale sharks are believed to cover vast distances. Whale sharks, in evolutionary terms, are fairly recent. They appeared about 60 million years ago, when they and three other kinds of shark started feeding on plankton. And sharks weren't the only ones. Whales were trying it too. Massive animals, both fish and mammal, suddenly made radical changes in their diets. What was happening in the sea? It was believed there was a sudden global plankton bloom. Today, the humpback's only predators are humans and possibly packs of killer whales. But then, life was different. Sharks were getting bigger, and the one that evolved to prey on the whales was the biggest and most terrible of all. This was the Tyrannosaurus rex of the sea, Megalodon. Megalodon, big tooth, was the size of a whale shark and probably weighed more. And it was anything but placid. It would have eaten anything it could get its jaws around. There was nothing in the sea it wasn't big enough to kill. But how does anyone know Megalodon existed? The answer is its terrifying teeth. They've turned up in fossil beds all over the world, and the only explanation is a monster predator. The largest predatory shark today is the great white, and this is how its tooth compares to megalodon's. Megalodon was probably still around at the time of the early humans, but it disappeared about two million years ago with the onset of the great ice ages. Otherwise, you really would think twice about going into the water. Not that being attacked by a shark only a quarter the size of Megalodon is any better. The Great White is the here and now. It may have survived its giant cousin by being one of the few sharks that can warm its blood. Like Megalodon, the Great White is a mammal hunter, but it targets smaller prey. Like sea lions, humans are mammals, and are mammals that often go into the sea. 
this gives the great white shark a special place in the human psyche. These spectacular shots show the fury of the shark attack. And humans have declared war. About the worst thing that can happen to an animal is to have humanity for an enemy. For sharks, it's an evolutionary tragedy. On average, sharks attack 28 people every year, whilst we kill 100 million sharks. For these slow breeding animals, our impact may prove to be more devastating than the Permian mass extinction. And we don't even know what we're destroying. The most endangered shark in the world is a mythical creature that is hardly ever seen. It's a strange looking ray called the sawfish. Its home is the murky estuaries of the Northern Territories. And it uses a weapon that looks like it went out of fashion in prehistory. In fact, there's an ancient feel to the whole mudflat. These periscope fish are pop-eyed mullets. And the reptile that stalks them is a survivor from the Jurassic. A fin is all that gives the sawfish's presence away. If a tooth of its vibrating saw hits a mullet, the mullet dies. The fish practically fly to avoid this prospect. Sawfish don't limit themselves to the estuaries. They also swim up river. Not many saltwater fish can tolerate river water, but sawfish can excrete extra salt and survive in otherwise lethal waters. Sawfish may go upstream to look for fresh sources of prey, but here they face plenty of competition. This is crocodile country. Every stretch of the river belongs to someone. The crocodiles that live here, salties, are the largest in the world, and they don't like other predators crossing their territory. Not that that's much of a worry for a three meter long shark with a barbed broadsword on its snout. There probably aren't any animals in this fish's world that would dare challenge it. If it's a male, its biggest danger is injury from other males. There are 20 lethal teeth on each side of the saw, reportedly used for jousting contests. Since Antarctolamna first swam in its Devonian lake, some sharks have always entered fresh waters, but it has never proved to be a popular place for them to live. The sawfish, though, goes far upstream. This river leads into Arnhem Land, one of the most isolated places on Earth. Here, the sawfish's story goes onto dry land. For 50,000 years, the native Australians have been depicting both real and legendary animals on the rocks. In a ceremonial cave is the rainbow serpent. And this is the sawfish. The paintings here, old as many of them are, aren't just an ancient curiosity the way European cave paintings are. Work is still in progress. There are layer upon layer of images. 
river creatures, land creatures, legendary creatures, and people. These ancient images are enduring reminders of just how far sharks have come. It's extraordinary to think that hundreds of kilometers from the sea, people of the desert have come to regard this shark as an integral part of their lives. But most people don't feel that way. In their long history that spans almost half a billion years, sharks have lived through the greatest upheavals of all time, including the extinction of the dinosaurs. But it is only in the last hundred years or so that we have turned against them, and now they may finally face extinction. If, with the help of science, our fear can turn to fascination, then that's the shark's best hope for the future. Then they will continue to evolve and change. It's anyone's guess what a shark born a million years from now will look like.